Send in the Guardians. Are, are you sure they're ready? If they can't take down the Lizard League, they'll never be ready. Wah, wah, wah. After a near four month break that everyone hated, Invincible is back! And to usher in the second half of the season, they gave us what might be one of the greatest episodes of the series. Appropriately titled, This Might Come as a Shock to You. That leaves the audience with one burning question. Did everyone just die? All right, obviously not everyone, but to have a massacre like this off rip is still insane. Especially when it's evidently way more brutal here than it was in the comics. Komodo Dragon having a full on mukbang that leaves Rex traumatized and down an arm. There's a greater narrative purpose to all of this carnage, however, so let's waste no time and dive right into the breakdown. We open on Thraxa with the aftermath of Mark and Nolan's battle against the Viltrumites, led by Steve Harvey. As Mark regains consciousness, he's horrified to lay his eyes upon a familiar sight. Another planet destroyed by Omni-Man's actions. The kingdom is in ruin, with debris painted by Thraxan blood. Innocent lives who had nothing to do with Nolan's conflict wrongfully taken much too soon. Even if their lifespan is significantly shorter than a human's, that these victims weren't able to make the most of their time on this planet and live life to the fullest. Thankfully, because of their short lifespans, the Thraxans have already learned not to assign blame and don't dwell on the past or things out of their control. Instead, they strive to look forward and, and rebuild with Mark's assistance. Young Grayson spending two months on the planet to help them restore Thraxa. I love this, as a big part of this sophomore season is Mark trying to prove to himself that he's nothing like his father. A key aspect to Nolan, since his very first scene, has been his tendency to ignore collateral damage, leaving others to clean up his mess for him. Eager to move on to the next thing without a single moment of self-reflection. He is extremely self-centered even when he doesn't intend to be. Which is why the read my books mark line was hilarious. Obviously the books aren't going to contain information relevant to the Viltrumites. But in the heat of the moment, he doesn't say protect your brother and my wife or anything sentimental. He just plugs his merch. But Mark doesn't want to ignore the collateral damage. He doesn't want to be self-centered like his father. So despite the impact it'll have onto his personal life, his relationships and academic endeavors especially, he puts the people affected by him and his father first. In other superhero shows, you would have the main character go, Oh, when I have homework, I'll have the props tomorrow. I'll check up on you guys when I can. But Mark pretty much immediately is like, Nah, I'm staying, and I'm not leaving until this kingdom is at 110%. For him, it's less about heroics, although that's a justification he can hide behind, and it's more about his own morality and accountability. This also allows us to see how fast Thraxen's age firsthand, as over the course of two months, Empress Andressa is already a geezer. I wonder if this makes Omni-Man less or more attracted to her. I find it admirable that despite their lifespan of a year, these Thraxans dedicated a significant chunk of that limited time to set up a better standard of living for the future generations, which turns out to be a positive impact Nolan had on a race of aliens for a change. He helped them see beyond their lifespan due to him being 2,000 years old. Andressa asks Mark to take his brother, baby Thanos, with him back to Earth so that he can grow up around people that he can form long, meaningful relationships with for a significant duration of his life. Instead of being surrounded by a constant string of death, becoming as desensitized as Nolan once was and still wants to be. Although I feel like Omni Man was reintroduced into the story a bit too soon, though that's probably the fault of eight episode seasons, it's still satisfying to see all these developments and Omni's somewhat reluctant path to redemption. Nevertheless, Mark is not only a big brother now, but also sort of kind of a father figure to his sibling. A rite of passage for all my favorite protagonists. Looking at you, Denji! Since this is the last time we'll probably be seeing her, Andressa gets to initiate the title drop for this episode. Of course, the title card is still on a steady transition to the colors of Mark's new suit, but it probably won't be finished until season 3, as I can confidently say we will not be seeing his black and blue suit this season. It's a slow burn! And I imagine once we are fully embracing the black and blue title cards, we'll return to the bloodstained gimmick. But man, as soon as Mark returns to Earth, we immediately explore the aforementioned consequences of his selfless deeds. His normal life is falling apart at the seams. He had his mother worried sick. His best friend is pissed at him for not being around. Cecil's pissed at him for not checking 
in. He missed two months of college. He's considering dropping out, and we already know Amber isn't gonna be happy about his prolonged absence. It's almost like they should break up or something. Mark's at a pivotal point in his life where he has to choose between being a superhero and being a normal college student. Trying to balance the two has only been causing frustration on both ends. This is another aspect of the series that I think is hindered by the short episode count, because in spite of the immaculate writing, it feels like we're speedrunning the collapse of Mark's life on campus. He's only been in college for four episodes! If we still had 10 to 13 episode seasons, we had more time to see him make new friends and really get involved with the school, this would feel a lot more effective. But as it stands, we already saw this outcome coming a mile away, and it's hard to have any sort of emotion towards it. Like, I sympathize with Mark, but that's because he's already going through a lot, not because he or the audience is attached to this school and the characters that attend it. But I don't want to dwell on this for too long, so let's keep it pushing. After being caught up to speed on everything, Debbie takes the news of baby Thanos pretty well, all things considered. She's already been coming to terms with the notion that her marriage was a mere facade to Nolan, and that the greatest trick up his sleeve will always be dodging accountability. Suffice to say, she finds that Nolan becoming a hero on another world and starting another family, only to lead his new life into ruin once again, is just par for the course. It initially caught me off guard that Debbie was willing to look after Mark's brother with no resentment, just because of the downward spiral in the first half of the season. But this is where Invincible separates itself from your average predictable drama. There's no unnecessary arc of her rejecting the kid, but learning to warm up to him. She instantly recognizes that he is just another victim of circumstance, wanting to take him in instead of handing him over to the government. She's truly a mother at heart, and a great one at that, and in a way, this might have been exactly what she's been needing. Between Nolan uprooting their lives and leaving, and Mark throwing himself deeper into the superhero world, she just felt like her family was broken and everything was out of her control. This isn't to say that baby Thanos is solely around to fill a void, but that Debbie has a chance to help set this child on the right path and ensure he doesn't turn into another Omni-Man by instilling good values into him, just like she did with Mark. She also refuses to ignore Nolan's collateral damage, even though it'd be easy for her to say that she wants nothing to do with it and hand BT off to Cecil. She helps shoulder the burden placed onto Mark. Dead be dead aside, the Grayson family is pretty admirable. They're bouncing back stronger than ever, even enforcing their boundaries with Cecil later in the episode, who seems kind of surprised that they're not intimidated by him anymore. The image he's been hiding behind is slowly getting unraveled, as he's no longer being treated as a superior, but an equal. And I love it. Speaking of Cecil though, my boy Donald, aka Bobby Hill, is finally putting his foot down, confronting Cecil and demanding to learn the truth around his existence after discovering he's not all flesh and blood, but shockingly, robot too. Cecil complies with his demands and reveals that Donald's brain was the only thing intact after he attempted to blow up Omni-Man. So the GDA built him a new body. One that Cecil champions as a vast improvement. The situation is a total ship of thesis. Grappling with the existential dread of if Donald is the same person after having his original body replaced with technology. This is yet another area where Invincible is just running circles around other shows. And not just superhero media. It's rare for a supporting character to not only be a major focus of the season, but to be dealt with one of the most horrifying mindfucks a human could face the question of if their body is even truly their own. If they're even still human. The insane nightmare he has later in the episode really encapsulates this, as he gets choked out by his robotic skeleton, representing the fear that he's been stripped of his humanity. Just very good stuff all around that really gets you thinking. Of course, Cecil comes across as the gaslighting yet arguably well-intentioned dick we've come to know him as, explaining that he tinkered with Donald's memory and kept him in the dark on this to spare him from PTSD. From the mental spiral that could arise from this disturbing revelation, he gives a fuck even though he's very cold about it. Considering this episode doesn't really wrap up the storyline, it's reasonable to assume that there's a bit more to uncover. Another detail Cecil left out, but for now, I'm really digging the direction they're taking Donald in. Again, this isn't something you'd get from a lot of other shows, and helps cement how special Invincible is. Too bad they had to remind us that Amber's stuff is still pretty painful to watch. And I'm not one of the many Amber haters out there. I'm just sick of watching a relationship that's so clearly destined to fail. And this episode is really laying it on thick. First off, Amber's friends are shocked that Mark's actually a real person. One of Amber's friends poking fun at her, claiming she thought Amber just pulled the boyfriend card on creepy dudes at parties. The 
this alone would crush me if I was Mark. Make me feel like I'm an inadequate partner. But as he and Ember catch up, we learn that her grandpa died. And Mark had no idea. He wasn't around to comfort her. And as a cherry on top to all of this, Amber addresses how people kept asking her where Mark was and that she hated having to lie about it. That she knew what she signed up for, but it still sucks. At this point, the show is practically screaming at us that this relationship clearly isn't going to work. So why does it continue to drag it out? Hasn't everyone involved suffered enough? Mark, Amber, and the viewers? And to make matters worse, Mark has to go back into space, and it's used to once again make his relationship with Amber as hard to watch as possible. Enough is enough! Please just rip the band-aid off already! But this is nothing compared to the most uncomfortable relationship of the series. Robot, aka Rudy, and Monster Girl. Concerned that Immortal is pushing her too hard when it comes to exercising her power, knowing how dire the drawback is, Rudy tries to speak up for her, only to get chastised by the both of them. Look, his heart is absolutely in the right place, but as Monster Girl says, it feels like he's coming from a place of authority after only one date. He doesn't do this with anyone else on the team, and it can easily come across as him lacking faith in Monster Girl, that she can't handle a simple training exercise. Still, it does beg the question of how many transformations she has left before she's reduced to a mere infant, if not worse, and what measures can be taken to keep her on the battlefield without driving her into an early grave. Thankfully, a crisis is able to derail the cringe fest, as Cecil informs everyone that a ship from Mars is steadily heading towards Earth putting Shapesmith on the spot as he delves into his origin story. Also, it's hilarious that everyone but Black Samson figured out that he was a Martian. Anywho, Martians enslave sequids as they can't penetrate their skin, and Shapesmith's selfish actions to fulfill his desires to escape the planet inadvertently led to the sequid hive mind possessing an astronaut, sending them directly to Earth to enslave the human race. Why do living beings love enslaving each other so much? We're like, deeply troubled as a concept, but before the guard of the globe face impending tragedy, Rex suggests bringing Eve back into the fold, having a heart-to-heart -heart with her, reassuring her that although things can get messy when you're trying to save the world, the world is still a better place because of people like her striving to make a difference, that she can't let herself be defined by her mistakes. It's a really sweet moment that shows how far Rex has come as a person. It may have taken a severely traumatic event of getting cut by a mortal, but he's truly maturing. He's not all the way there. He's still very cocky, which ends up causing him more than he could fathom by the end of the episode. But season one Rex would never try to have a serious talk with Eve, especially without trying to get in her pants. You really love to see it, and it makes what's about to happen all the more crushing. As with most of the Guardians venturing out into space, the Lizard League uses the opportunity to initiate an attack and take control of the nuclear launch facility, an emergency that Rex, Duplicate, and Ray are way out of their depth with. Keep in mind, we saw in the Adam Eve special that the former Guardians of the Globe were barely on equal footing with the Lizard League. It wasn't until Omni-Man pulled up that they were able to turn the tides. The current iteration of the Guardians, while powerful in their own right, still needs to earn their stripes, save for the veterans. They're, for all intents and purposes, still amateurs. So when there's only three of them to score up against the Lizards, it's pretty obvious that they're in for a very, very bad time. Things aren't faring any better in space either, as the Guardian ship is obliterated with a missile, leaving them scrambling to get onto the Martian ship. Good thing Rex convinced Eve to join the fray, because if she wasn't around, that missile would have reduced them all to debris, floating in the vastness of space. Maybe Mark and Immortal could have tanked it? I don't know. And once they get on the ship, it doesn't take long for them to attract the Sequids, leaving our A-team off on a pretty intense cliffhanger. Elsewhere, Rex, Duplicate, and Ray are getting absolutely demolished by the Lizard League, especially Komodo Dragon. While Salamander is taken out with a pretty awesome display of Ray's side shifting powers, and Iguana is later killed by a panicking Rex, Komodo is tanking every attack like a champ, but takes out the B team with minimal effort in comparison. Not only does this do kill all the Kates, smashing the two together like a pair of cymbals, but this motherfucker swallows Ray whole! That's too bad he's gone in one scene! What the hell is even happening? Ray feels especially brutal, despite not seeing her corpse unlike Kate, because for a moment, you think she's gonna burst out of him. But Komodo knows how to keep his food down. 
I guess this is a good argument for why Ant-Man couldn't just go up Thanos' ass. Yet somehow, the brutality doesn't even end there. As Komodo goes for seconds and eats Rex's arm! I know it can be hard to hit your daily protein intake, but jeez! Thankfully, this was a bad move on Komodo's end, as Rex's arm blows him up from the inside, killing Komodo for good, I, I think. Really hope they can't regenerate, being lizard people at all. You really feel for Rex here, man. Dude is just now turning his life around, and thought watching Earth would be smooth sailing. Instead, he had to watch two of its teammates die before his very eyes in a very brutal manner, one of those teammates being his ex. And just when I thought he was the last man standing, the Lizard King strolls up and whips out a Glock! He's moments away from blowing Rex's brains out. This is just horrifying! And the masses have to wait a week just to see what happens. Unless you read the comics, but even then, they may turn it up a notch. This adaptation has already been moving things around and making things way more brutal than they were in the comics. Case in point, Rey was simply tossed into Komodo's mouth in the source material, instead of making it seem like she had a fighting chance. Although opening up your mid-season premiere with a Shibuya-level incident is wild, I love it! Because alongside the battle at the start of the episode, it proves that Earth is kinda cooked without a Viltrumite, without Mark! Contrary to what he believes. Again, at their peak, the Guardians of the Globe still needed Omni-Man to get the upper hand against the League. If Mark wasn't out in space, Kate and Rey would probably still be alive. But at the same time, the Guardians can't afford to be this cooked without Mark. They have to step up their game, if only three of them are going to be left behind to defend an entire planet. This whole situation was one awful wake-up call for them, and hopefully Cecil. However, amongst all this death, the episode ends with a bit of a victory for the audience, as we see that Alan survived and is more ripped than ever. Thaddeus admits that he sent them out there for the sole purpose of making him stronger by getting his ass kicked. You know, like Vegeta. Despite the ominous fakeouts, Thaddeus is indeed a good guy, which makes sense. He's voiced by Peter Cullen. But as it turns out, He's also a Viltrumite, signified by a goofy moment that I'm definitely gonna work into a Manscaped ad down the road. Whoa, 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 hey, 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 hey! I definitely think he had to fake his death to get away from Viltrum, so I'm curious when we'll get more information on his backstory. Regardless, a plan is set into motion to turn the tides against Viltrum, and I think maybe, just maybe, the good guys will actually have a shot at winning. A lot of them are still gonna die, though. But that's everything I have for this week's Invincible, and I'm hoping I'll be even more punctual of next week's episode breakdown, as Amazon blessed us with screeners for the whole season. So, you might want to subscribe and stay in the loop. Drop your thoughts in the comments below, keep the convo rolling over on social media at Altric Vox and at Roundtable Vids, and I'll catch y'all next time. Thank you so much for watching. Peace!